Um, so I'm going to just pass this mic and another one, I think, over. Um, what, what this process is really about is uh, manufacturing safety and uh, getting people to uh, really think about the, the process it takes to go from um, the, an original invention to, to really something that, that is able to hit the market and, and work in our spaces, be replicable, be safe, and be available. So, um, Barry Griffin, Andy Yoder, uh, Aaron Yoder, and uh, Liz Bresinger. Thank you. Um, last few years at uh, Slow Tools Conference, we've talked a lot about how to make these tools and lots of great ideas and little, thank you, little, hmm, little wonderful sounding things and little prototypes. And um, <clears throat> so, where do we go from here? Um, we've talked about it in the past on manufacturing spaces, and there's been some new ideas. Uh, so I'd like to just go do a brief, very brief run through of the maker spaces I've been involved with, and um, and then a little bit about safety uh, in terms of testing. Um, once you build it, build something, then you know you got to kind of have to test it, and uh, that can that can be a, a problem by itself. I can show you that here. So this is uh, my my garage on Bainbridge Island. I lived there for 30 years. These are two high school apprentices. I had about 20, I paid them $10 an hour. They worked um, three or four hours a week in the late afternoon. Um, here they are building a, um, a windmill tower. That's a Datsun um, differential, <laughs> cut in half, um, for a reciprocating windmill, very large. The design challenge was how could you make the, the power of a 30 or 40 foot windmill but only 10 feet from the ground. So they ended up with a long arm, bamboo arm, that was about 30 feet long with a sail at the end. And it would go like this, and like a sailboat, it would jibe and come back the other way. So it was reciprocating high power. It worked really well. Um, so here they are building it. Um, this is uh, the gentleman on the right. It was 16 years old. Um, then he's now a, in the mass, a Master's of Engineering program at University of Mississippi, has a BSME from uh, University of Alabama, and he's the innovation engineer for a recycling equipment company. So these kinds of sk skill development in design and manufacturing in, a, in this space may not lead to farm tools, but they lead to um, understanding the process. So in, in, a, in a maker space, I've always felt my job is to make it safe, but also just model the, the process. Uh, moving this. Could someone uh, move it for me? OK, this is the. Um, Maker space that I constructed with a fair amount of resistance from the faculty uh, to start with uh, at, at Harvard uh, in 2009 and 10. And this is some of the uh, kids in there, students, young engineers. Um, they're working right here on an um, extracurricular or an independent project for Woods Hole, developing a very low power uh, deep sea. Uh, energy uh, generator, which we tested in the pool. Um, and then the fellow in the back uh, is working on a, a bicycle pannier. Uh, and there, there were uh, eight projects in this room. And then there's tools and machine shops and other things in other places. But this was this room uh, where the project benches were, and then another room next, next to it was where people hung out, where the computers were there. Faculty thought there'd be two or three people in there. There were 50 on coming and going from 9 in the morning till 2 in the morning uh, with boyfriends, girlfriends, parents, and other people. Um, and it's a very jazzy, uh, more than I'd hoped for. <laughs> it was just great. I didn't feel like I had to do anything except keep it safe um, and then just 
manage the <laughs> let, let people go and, and kick when I need to. Okay. Um, this is a just one part of the workshop on a community uh, run modern uh, maker space on Bainbridge Island, Washington. It's called Barn, uh, Bainbridge Artisan um, Artists Resource Network. And it has, it's a complete, complete facility. It can do anything in there, wood, metal, casting, jewelry. And they've also allowed actual companies to come in and do production. And the way they do that is they just limit the amount of time that a, a, a company for profit can come in and use the space. Um, they have to yield after an hour or two or something like that. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, this is a um, the maker space. <laughs> uh, company started in 1906. Uh, it's in Seattle, Washington. It's a company I worked for as a design engineer and then as a salesman. Uh, here they're constructing a uh, a winch, a high-powered winch, um, and it's a combination of forgings, machining, casting, welding. Electrical drives, very sophisticated electrical uh, variable frequency drives, clutches, uh, and the cost of manufacturing this has, in the 20 years we were working on this product line, has gone down about 30% because of refinements in the way we do it. We've gone from um, lots of reducing welding. So one of the first goals in design, we actually reduced the number of parts in this by 30 or 40 percent. It is possible. Uh, this class of machine and al almost all kinds of machines in manufacturing in this kind of environment, the actual cost of materials are about 20 percent of the sales price of this, of this machine. This company's been in business uh, 10 years before Boeing. They started in Seattle. They're in their fourth generation. They're a union shop. They've continued to make basically the same thing with between 30 and 50 workers uh, for 111 years. So it's a matter of producing high, when they produce about 80% of the, now, of the high-end custom winches in the United States and, and some in, in Australia as well. So they just hung in there and improved, improved, improved. But this is their maker space. You can imagine what it takes to lift one of these and move it. So the tooling in the shop becomes pretty critical depending on what you're trying to do in there, whether you're buying it out or whatever. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, this, <laughs> this, is, um, this thing I'm wearing here, I wore this for a reason, this whatever you call it. Um, jacket or whatever. This comes from Filson, which is a company in Seattle that was formed about the time of the Alaska Gold Rush to, to create clothes for that industry. And when I started as a design engineer for, <laughs> for Markey, uh, we were each given one of these, but the industrial version, which had pockets in it for your drawings and all kinds of things that you needed back then uh, before computers. Um, and, and but so this is the dress version of it that you, that you get when you start <laughs> going in front of people. This company's still, another company's still in business. Um, the Northwest has been a very um, creative area, of course, Microsoft, Amazon, Nordstrom's, you know, they're, they're, it's a, and it's a, it's a city of immigrants uh, as well, uh, from Norway, Croatia, and other places. Okay, this is my maker space. Uh, thanks to John Lee, who was a manager at Allendale Farm. I was allowed to build this uh, maker space at Allendale Farm in Brookline. Um, and so I built this maker space. It's 12 by 12, but it has uh, about two and a half kilowatt of uh, solar energy. There's no, no power going there. And the idea here was to all the t think about all the tools that we created to be uh, no more than t what two horses would do. In other words, if you could farm this property with two horses back in the day, why can't we farm it with two electrical horsepower today? Just a, just a thought question, you know. 
so, um, and then on the top there is one of the projects that has come out of the Stone Barns effort here. That's a, called a beam tractor. You can see that long tube. It's 20, 20 feet long. And it goes in a circle or linearly, and um, uh, it has a carriage that goes back and forth. So this is the beginning in my experiments on digital, uh, digital horticulture or d digital agriculture. Um, okay. Okay, uh, this is a failure. I'm switching now into failure. Um, this is a, a, a bollard for a tug down in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, rope got, <laughs> the rope was so slippery, it had three turns around it. That's a 14 inch diameter, three quarter wall steel tubing. And <laughs> little did we know that this rope was so strong and so slippery that it just snoosed the mushroom that steel tube and then when the the but there was so much force that it actually just ripped this bollard right off the deck okay what does this illustrate <clears throat> this illustrates a really important po point in how humans think about um how we relate to the we're, we're kind of linear thinking people you do twice as much, you get twice as much. You do three times as much, you do three times as much. But the world, um, the New Newtonian world, uh, works nonlinearly. So as we all know, you know, momentum is the square, the velocity. That's why we have shock absorbers and airbags and that kind of thing. So wind, wind, the forces of wind goes up as the square of the wind speed. So you double the wind, you get four times the uh, force. So the world of flow, everything is flowing. So, and flow is nonlinear. The effects of flow on us are nonlinear. <clears throat> so when you're designing something, you have to think about what's the worst case uh, change in um, speed or pull that you're going to experience, and how is it going to flow through the machine? All right, we have to test all this, right? <laughs> all right, so next. Okay, this is a video of uh, something I, I did, I was experimenting with and I thought about it later. This is uh, Cardson Tools Tilly, and it's on the carriage for the digital tractor on the beam moving sideways. Normally the Tilly moves in a, a straight line, but we discovered that, oh my God, it's just fabulous when you move it sideways. But is that the way it was designed? It wasn't designed to go sideways, I don't think. But, so here, here well, your video isn't working, but, um, yeah, yeah, if you could do that. Okay, there it is. There's the Tilly going sideways. And Mike said, that's really great. Then we got to think, what about the bearings in there? And is, is it designed for, are the blades gonna fly off? So this is attached to the carriage, uh, the, the tractor's stable. So, is this proper? And this illustrates one of the things Aaron will probably talk about. You can control the design of something to the nth degree. You can control the production and how you make it to the nth degree. But you cannot control how someone uses it. So a lot of accidents, in my experience, have been someone just using it the wrong way. What? Yeah. But what warranty? I didn't see any warranty. <laughs> That why you gave me a deal on it? <laughs> okay, next one. <clears throat> okay, so this is the, um, illustrates the next uh, part of design for safety. If you look at the accidents that happen, they're, they're and Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, most of them are tractor accidents, right? And hand injuries and arm injuries around rotating machinery or animals. So, so, what do we do? The first thing we do is we put rollover protection on the tractors, right? And then cabs to get you out of the weather, keep you asleep. Yesterday I just got the, the feed from International Harvester. You know, when this show's going on, the big farm tool show in Louisville is also going on, right? And, and so they're putting announcements out. And the brand new International Harvester tractor, uh, some of its main features in the cab are more cup holders and and one that can actually um, hold a two-liter bottle. You know, and it's, it's connected to the, you can be connected up to 300 miles, people can watch what's going on in the tractor. 
So, so that, that's one approach, to make the actual tractor safer. safer. Or the other way to do it is you just get, don't, you're not even on the tractor. So here we go into the realm of what Mike's working on or some kind of robotics or what people are calling cobots, which, um, so we're not even gonna be on this machine. We're just gonna be watching it or close to it and out of harm's way. So a cobot is a new word that's come up and that is a collaborative robot. So you're, you're watching something and it's doing something uh, interesting, and so you can, you can sort of change the program on the fly. It's interactive use of a very sophisticated, uh, potentially sophisticated robot. So we're going to see probably more and more of this first as um, a safety, uh, for, for all its reasons, efficiency, safety, and that kind of thing. So getting, getting the person <laughs> away from the, from the V squared, V squared cubed, uh, issues that are going to happen with forces. Okay, next one. Uh, no, and the final thing is, this is happening in Europe. Um, okay, it's called cable robotics. Uh, it's developed quite extensively in Europe. It's a conference every two years. Um, and last year's conference in Quebec, some folks from the University of Nebraska were there, and they're doing um, field monitoring. Is that correct? Is that what they call that, Aaron? Yeah, phenotyping with cables on a field and moving things around in a field. Um, this is the most efficient way to move things. Um, you, you don't touch the ground. There's no ground compaction. You come from above. You know, the, the ideal, the perfect farmer is a bird. It just flies down, <laughs> does what it, and flies away. So this is a, a model I'm working on for the future of a cable robotic farm that moves um, things just with cables uh, for, for doing work on the farm. This way, you're, there's not even a machine. There's just cables and winches at the bottoms of these, this is my area of expertise, cable and winches, um, ar around the farm. And this is, this is not new. This has been done in logging in, uh, in the West Coast. Very dangerous, by the way, <laughs> extremely dangerous. But now we have uh, new materials, new cables. These are all synthetic cables. They're stronger than steel. So there's been technical advances in that. So this kind of thing now it eliminates the, uh, all the other, some of the, many of the other issues of the, that might happen in uh, safety-related issues because there's redundancy in the cables as well. So uh, that's sort of uh, my... My uh, my part. So. Yeah, good questions at the end. Am I next? I don't know. Who's next? Why didn't I tell you guys? I didn't have any guys here. Well, safety's kind of boring, and no one wants to hear about it. So let's put it in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, like I mentioned, I get to talk about the fun stuff that we all need to hear about but nobody wants to hear about. So normally you have to offer food at any safety session you do to get people there or mandate it somehow. And in agriculture, it's hard to mandate things. Um, so it's really tough to, to, to talk about safety and health with people. Um, <clears throat> my name's Aaron Yoder. I'm from the University of Nebraska. I live in Omaha, but I grew up in a small farm in central Pennsylvania. My uncle and grandfather were coal miners, and they farmed in the evenings and weekends on about 60 acres where we did hay and had about uh, a dozen beef cattle. Um, so I got to experience that growing up, so the maker space of, of a farm and all the stuff I got to build. For some reason, my older brother was all into video games, so now he can't change a light bulb, and I can rewire my house. But anyhow, um, so it's, it's our choices we make, right? So I want to talk a little bit about designing safe ag equipment and some of the human factors things to think about. There's a handout with great more details. I normally teach this over four or five hours in some of the courses I teach. Um, so we're covering it in 10 minutes today. So it's sort of like the speed dating version of safety and health. Um, would like to uh, also uh, talk about my Central State Center for Ag Safety and Health, the National Institute for Ag Safety and Health. Uh, which is under the CDC, helps fund these centers around the country. Uh, the closest one in this region is in Cooperstown, New York, at Bassett Healthcare. Um, they have a, uh, 
uh, one of the NIOSH-funded centers there, which started on the health side, has moved more to the engineering, and now to the outreach side, sort of picking up where cooperative extension left off uh, when it came to safety and health training. And the first point I want to make is it doesn't matter how you design the equipment, people are going to figure out a way to use it unsafely. Um, <laughs> And Barry had all the pictures, and I ha don't have a whole lot of time, so I don't have any more pictures than this, uh, but please don't fall asleep on me. Um, because we, we know people are going to abuse things, and sometimes in our testing, our failure modes analysis and other things like that, we ask people to break stuff. How can you use this in a way that we haven't thought of using it, like running the Tilly sideways, but this is a little more extreme than that. Um, so just a little bit about protecting people. It's not a new concept. We generally care about each other, um, and oftentimes we always like to make rules. My kids think I have too many safety rules, uh, but way back in the Code of Hammurabi, I think I spelled that wrong, it has an A. Um, does anybody know what that is? Have you ever heard of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? That's where that started. Um, some people don't like that concept. I think Gandhi said that if, if we applied that rule to everything, everyone would be blind. Um, <clears throat> so, anyhow, enough of the philosophy side of it, but feeling that safety is important, we generally care for each other, we don't want other people to get injured. Um, so as we're designing and thinking about processes and equipment and how we manage people, keeping that in the back of our mind. I don't like the statement safety first, because if we did safety first, we wouldn't do anything, because everything we do is inherently dangerous. Um, but let's keep safety equal with the other things that we're thinking about. Um, so again, thinking about who's responsible for the safety part of it, these are some legal terms. I get to do some expert witness stuff and see how the legal system works, which we, that's a whole other lecture on how broken that is. Um, but it doesn't matter if you're working with a bunch of friends, if you're working with people that you don't think would ever sue you for something. Um, they probably have health insurance, and if you get injured, the health insurance company is going to sue somebody to pay for your medical bills. So there's sort of a, a, a system there that's going to make you liable for something if you've been negligent. So those are some terms that we'll start talking about. So the liability who's obligated um, to rectify or recompensate for a problem that exists um, or an injury that happened. And then there's different types of liability that they do. They talk at different states, I've come to find, have different policies and rules regarding this. There are some federal regulations, but there's strict liability where the manufacturer of the product is solely to blame if someone gets hurt. Uh, but that's not always the case. Normally they try to spread the blame among everybody. And that's where they call uh, contributory negligence. So you used the tool wrong. So that's when the manufacturers and the users that got hurt start arguing back and forth that you didn't do what you were supposed to do with it. So that's why the operator's manuals for the tractors in the 70s were this thick, and now the operator's manuals now are three or four volumes. So they can tell you everything that you should not do with that piece of equipment, and if you don't follow that, then they can use that against you. Um, so another thing to think of that I didn't even build in here, but operator's manual. So if you have a piece of equipment, tell people how to operate it correctly, tell them not what to do with it, um, and those type of things. So we have all the definitions again there in your handouts, and I have limited time, so I'm gonna go over some of those. Um, other terms that they use, assumption of risk, um, being aware of the danger, letting people know this is where we get all the warning labels and signs, and uh, I saw one the other day and it looked like Someone walking down the stairs, really funny, they were leaning back. I think it was supposed to be someone slipping and falling down the stairs. It's this triangle sign, but, um, so making sure you use the, the appropriate things, and we'll get to that later, but there's some standardization for certain machine designs that different organizations have built in, um, and following some of the standard practices when we're designing things, when we're building warning labels. A lot of the warning labels now hardly have any words on them, they're all pictograms. Um, so they can be multilingual without having to translate. So let's see. So who's responsible in the end once we get past all that legalese in terms, um, and these are some of the pots that we oftentimes put it in the designer. So it may not be the person that's building the tool, but the person that thought up the tool. Uh, the manufacturer, so this is the person that's making it. The person that's selling the tool, so even if you're just buying stuff from somebody else and selling it, uh, there could be a little bit of 
uh, blame placed there or a little bit of responsibility. And then the employer and the employee. Um, and then we often say, and I know from the cases I've worked in, normally the ones with shallow pockets get out of the case pretty quickly. The ones with the deeper pockets end up staying in the case a lot longer until a settlement's made. Um, So when we think about protecting people when, they, when we're designing the equipment, there's two different things we can do. We can eliminate the hazards, as many as we can through design. In agricultural equipment, that's pretty hard because we need to process something. Um, and the equipment can't tell between a, a piece of crop and a piece of person. Um, so it's the same sort of thing. Um, so we can, and um, Barry mentioned roll bars on tractors. Um, this will be my sales pitch for that. If you don't have one, put it on. They're $1,000 or less. They make them for most tractors, and it's pretty cheap health insurance, and that's as far as I'll go. But I'd love to talk for hours on rollover protection on tractors. As Barry mentioned, it is the leading cause of death in agriculture, although we're seeing all-terrain vehicles getting pretty close to that, people flipping ATVs. Not all of them are agriculturally related, and they do make rollover protection for ATVs now. There's a company out of Can uh, Australia called Quad Bar. So if you have an ATV, I would check that out. Um, Side-by-sides aren't much better. They have roll bars, but nobody wears their seat belts or helmets when they're on them. Getting a farmer to wear a helmet is pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> some, some advocates for rollover protection say that even when you're on a tractor, you should wear a helmet because even if you have a roll bar, you're probably going to hit your head if you roll it over. So um, that's, that's a fight I'm not ready to fight yet. Um, Interlocking safety switches, that annoying switch on the seat that when you stand up, it turns the tractor off or turns your spinning blades off. All of those type of things we can think about as we're designing stuff. There's a whole set of standards, how far the hazards can be away from the operator so that you can't put your hands or feet in it. You know, we think about the handlebar on a push mower, how far away you are from the blade. Some of those things were actually thought out so you don't put your feet under the mowers. Um, eliminating... Uh, the potential hazard through safety practices, um, we don't listen very well um, when we do things. So if you tell somebody, you know, and a, a good example that we can all relate to, look both ways before you, anyone, cross the street, right? Um, that type of thing. We see lots of caution, warning. Uh, telling people to do safe things oftentimes isn't as good as designing the safety features into the equipment. And we know that. Same way with personal protective equipment. Uh, getting people to wear safety glasses, uh, not as jewelry on top of their head or around their neck. Same thing with respirators. Oftentimes, once uh, talk to someone from the, the West Coast about all the wildfires out there and the people still having to work through those conditions um, and not, people either not being aware of the respirators that they needed to be wearing or not having them available. So there's lots of things like that, lots of barriers to... Um, telling people through safe practices and safe management. And then oftentimes our supervisors don't use those things, so then they're setting a bad example for all the workers underneath them. So there's, there's a lot of issues with trying to do it through safe practices, where if we can design the machinery safety, it's going to be a lot better for us. A couple minutes. I'm looking at my timer. I'm at eight. I have two, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to get through it. Um, so looking at existing safety standards, no one likes to talk about OSHA, but OSHA generally cares for people. They're, they're not trying to make money. They do make some money, and they're, they're, there's a whole uh, other lecture there. But looking at what standards are out there, because they're, they oftentimes will cite things that they've seen happen a lot out there. So they're really a good information source. They have a lot of good safety information. Um, oftentimes it doesn't apply to small farms unless you have 10 employees or more. Uh, the OSHA regulations oftentimes aren't enforced. Um, but if you do something wrong and someone gets hurt or killed on your farm, the lawyers know about OSHA, and they're going to say, why weren't you following this? And just by saying I'm a small farm doesn't uh, exempt you from that. Um, so, And then there's other standards, as I mentioned, with the uh, professional type standards. There's an organization I work with called the American Society of Ag and Biological Engineers. And they have all kinds of different safety standards um, about both designing equipment and then some safety stuff, like something you may have never thought of. We'll get to hand control or to human factors in a minute. But on most modern day tractors, the controls are color coded. So if it's a direction control or something like that, it's black. If it's a power engagement like a PTO, it's yellow. 
Um, if it's throttle or engine speed related, it's orange. So doing that and then putting the, the controls in a fashion so that if you push on something, it goes faster. If you pull on it, it goes slower. Some of those basic concepts that we'll talk about in human factors are also in those safety standards. So when we're designing, look at what standards are out there, look at other people's equipment and see what they're following. And then we can do some hazard analysis. So enough for the engineering side of it, just a little bit about human factors. And uh, the green heron ladies did a great job yesterday talking a little bit about the health and how things fit our body. I've heard other people say about different sizes. So we're really trying to maximize how um, our bodies fit the tools that we're using to make it healthier. Uh, when it's more comfortable to do, we're oftentimes more productive. So that's sometimes the carrot we can put out in front of people is if your workers are more productive, if we're keeping them healthy, we're keeping them safe, they're probably going to be around longer, their skill sets are going to be around and that sort of thing. So the main concepts we look at here, the human characteristics, which we talked about, the size, the speed. Sometimes we can also throw mental, char mental characteristics in here too. We don't want to stress people out. It's like when my parents used to try to reset their VCR time um, and they just gave up on it so it just blinked 12 all the time because they didn't want to mess with it. That was a mental overload. So they just stopped doing something and you shut down. So there's lots of things to think about under that and they're all listed in your handouts there. The workplace and equipment, which we've been talking about a lot. The environmental factors. I do some work on heat illness in ag workers. Um, so thinking about the environments we're working in. We talked about the smoke and dust and the respiratory issues, but there's also heat and cold issues to think about. Uh, when we're comfortable, we work more productively and safer. Um, how many of you do stretches before you go out in the morning? Yoga. We've got some yoga sheets on yoga and farming, some of that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of people don't do that. It's like when I teach my kids in soccer practice and they do their warm-ups and then I just hop in and play with them and pull some muscles and that sort of thing. It's along those same lines. Um, and then finally wrapping it up, just a few of these basic principles, um, thinking about um, what are the, the human factors. So making things effective um, when we're making the equipment, uh, we know people are going to misuse equipment, so thinking about their misuses, which I'll get to on the, the last and next slide. And then um, design characteristics that, like I said, are intuitive. When we push something, we expect it to go faster. If it's an accelerator, if it's a brake pedal, when we push it, we expect it to stop. So there's some different things like that. Um, and the, the last statement there, I think, is, is kind of good, and there's an example in your handouts of that, but it's easier to modify the equipment than the person. Um, have you guys ever tried to modify people? Um, it's hard to do. But thinking about forces, how hard it is to push a pedal or something like that. You could ask the person to lift weights and do strength training so that they can push the pedal, or you can just make the force less on the pedal to push, right? And it's easier to make the force less on the pedal than it is to get somebody to lift weights and get their legs stronger. So that type of thing. It doesn't have to be major modifications to the person. Um, and then finally, thinking about different types of human error. So how are people going to mess up when they're using the piece of equipment? Um, we can forget to do things, which is the error of omission. So we admitted a step or a task that we're doing. And then there's the error of commission. So we did something. We either did it in the wrong order or we did too much of something. Um, and then we get those errors. And they list those uh, commission errors in a little bit more detail there, again, in the handout. So I'd love to talk for hours, but I only have 10 minutes, and I took 12 or 13. <laughs> so thank you. So I'm Liz Brensinger, and as most of you know by now, I'm one of the owners of Green Hair and Tools. It is, as far as we know, still the only company in the world that's focused on scientifically designing equipment that is truly ergonomic for women. And I will say that both of us came from um, public health and nonprofit backgrounds. We approached our so-called for-profit business with kind of a nonprofit mentality. <laughs> and there are problems with that, let me tell you. Um, but we're a very small company. And we really are focused on, you know, trying to design really solid, effective, safe equipment that will make the lives of farmers and gardeners, particularly, but not only women, easier. And we're trying to use a commercial approach to that. And I think 
a way of understanding sort of the paradox of our business is that USDA considers us one of their great success stories. Um, we've had four USDA Small Business Innovation Research Grants, and they're really happy with what we've done. The flip side is almost everything we've done is sort of a cautionary tale. Um, and so I want to talk about some of that pretty quickly. The, the first thing that I'm sure you're all aware of is the concept of economies of scale. And our business model in this country, as Anne mentioned yesterday, and most of you probably know, is really, it doesn't know what to do with companies like ours. And I would argue it doesn't really care that much about companies like ours. Economies of scale means it's basically the more of something that you make, the less expensive it is. So when you're a really small company with you know, a, a relatively small market compared to the whole US, for example, that's a struggle right away. So I want to talk about um, sort of our success stories and our challenges using two examples. One is our shovel which some of you probably saw yesterday in the greenhouse. It is the first product that we commercialized. It, um, believe it or not, over two years of R&D went into designing that shovel. And everything about it is ergonomic um, from the standpoint of female users. So it's great. We brought it out in 2011. And what gives both of us the strength to go on sometimes is that we've gotten wonderful feedback from women about how using that shovel has really made their lives easier. And sometimes people contact us with really specific issues. You know, I had plantar fasciitis. I don't have it anymore using your shovel. I've told my podiatrist about it. You know, so we know that our tools um, are a good thing. But first of all, um, we have worked with wonderful design teams. And Aaron is the one person who's been the consistent member of our design team through all four of our projects. Um, so we've had these fabulous collaborative pro processes to come up with our tools, but then getting them out to market is where the real challenge comes in. Um, for our shovel, for example, um, it has a blade that combines features of a shovel and a spade. The story behind that is that our team, you know, sort of brainstormed what are the characteristics of the blade for this tool. We were most interested in ease of digging, but we also wanted it to be um, as versatile a tool as possible, so we wanted people to be able to transfer material. And we had discovered in our research that women actually tend to shovel differently than men. Men tend to put a blade in the ground straight, women tend to put a blade in the ground at an angle. So we wanted a blade that would support that digging style. A member of our team who has not been on any of our subsequent teams, but he was a faculty member at Penn State, and he had uh, connections with the largest shovel manufacturer in North America. And he went to this shovel manufacturer, and he said, this is what we're looking for in a blade. Um, and the guy said, oh, you know, we could, we could make that for you. We could take, you know, two of our existing blades and, you know, do something in the process to create what you want. And lo and behold, that's how our blade was created. Now, there were two problems with that. One is, he didn't talk to us before he went to that huge manufacturer. Even though we had him sign this pretty elaborate confidentiality statement, <laughs> So he goes to this giant manufacturer and essentially gives away what we're trying to do. Okay, so that's a problem. Second problem is they patented it, which we found out about after the fact. You know, we're a tiny little company. They're like, ha ha, you know, we can do whatever the heck we want. And, and that is one of the realities, okay? Now, the upside is, but we got a good blade, right? We could not have made that blade or made the shovel without them because at one point we were so sick of working with them that we looked at making very mod modest modifications to the design and having it made ourselves through another manufacturer. There's something called tooling. You all know what tooling is. You know, it's like the, the, the mold or the equipment that's necessary to make your part. We found out that for us to go to a different manufacturer and get the tooling made to make our blade would have cost, I, I think it was literally like almost $100,000. It was such a high figure that it was like, okay, that's not going to work. We would never, ever, ever, ever recoup that cost. So here we are. We're sort of, you know, figuratively speaking, still in bed with a company that really um, has a very different philosophy than us, and we're kind of at their mercy. 
But for right now, we're making the shovel, so that's the good part. Second thing I will tell you is that in terms of ergonomics, with a long tool like a shovel, if you're serious about ergonomics as we are, you have to offer different sizes. Most tools, as you know, are one size fits all, which is an absurd concept, right? So what we have learned is there's a reason why most companies don't make three sizes, and it has to do with making money, and it has to do with logistical issues. For example, um, we at one time were working on a wholesale program because we, we do sell online. That's one of our sort of solutions to some of this. We sell directly to, to customers. But we were trying to build up our wholesale business, and what we realized is that for a retail store, having three sizes of something is really a pain. They have to you know, think much more about their ordering because they ideally want to keep all three sizes in stock. It's somewhat arbitrary, like it just depends who happens to come in to buy, which sizes they need. And it's more sort of wall space. So what we found is, you know, a lot of stores, they might carry it for a while and then they just, they, they don't carry it anymore, not necessarily because they weren't selling them, but because it's too much of a pain. So that's one of the reasons we realized why so many things are quote unquote one size fits all. Um, the other project I wanna mention briefly is our tiller, which some of you saw um, us demonstrate yesterday. The tiller was the, the product of what was probably, for us, the most fun of all our design projects. And Aaron can attest, we had Aaron and um, another mechanical engineer who also knew a lot about electrical engineering, and we had an inventor, this, this amazing guy, no college education, um, he's a landscaper, and I would say he's pretty much of a genius. <laughs> and so, you know, the design that you see with that tiller um, it was a product of all five of us, plus an ergonomist um, who works with us part-time um, on these projects. But really, I think it was Bobby's vision. And he made, I don't know how many you know, iterations of the prototype we tested. He was you know, welding stuff in his shop and figured out a, a piece of equipment to like, get the flighting right. And it was an amazing process. So we're very excited about it. And then it's, OK, now how do we? make it manufacturable. Worked with a team of design engineers, um, one of the few companies anywhere that we found that seemed to do the kind of work we needed, which is how do we take this really cool prototype design and you know, make it something that we can actually make and sell. And um, you know, they went crazy with it. And we were new enough at that time that we didn't catch it right away, but they were um, including all of these custom parts to make this tiller. For every custom part, you're, you're creating tooling. So what we finally realized is we would never, ever be able to make and sell this tiller. It would probably cost $10,000 because they were having, it was as if they were designing for like not the real world. So we, we realized, um, we terminated our relationship with them. We went to a much smaller um, fabricator outfit near us that has worked with us ever since. But one of the issues also, we are very committed to making things in the US as close to our base in Pennsylvania as possible. The uh, counter rotating blades or augers that are on that machine, they're really the key to that machine. We wanted to have those cast, where basically they make a mold and they pour steel in and that's how you get your part and it's, you get a consistent part and ideally, you know, it's a strong and relatively economical way to do it. Um, we could not find a single US company that did casting that was willing to cast a part that small. I, I don't know why, you know, but this design engineering company tried, and then we tried. We literally could not get those made in this country. We, we had to go to China, which is like where we never wanted to go for anything. But what we learned is China has like a gazillion engineers. And Chinese companies are willing to try stuff. So we actually own tooling in China <laughs> to make those parts. And um, you know, hopefully it still exists over there somewhere. But the bottom line is you know, people talk about US manufacturing, and we're all for it. But there are some real deficits in US manufacturing. And just because something's made in the US does not mean it's necessarily going to be what you want it to be. The other part about the tiller 
Um, the reason, the main reason that it's not out in the world already is because this company that we found to work with, which is much, much, much better to work with than any other company to date in terms of manufacturers, they were not going to be able to make that tiller at a price that we could then turn around and sell it at a price that people would pay. So it's like, okay, we have this great machine which solves pretty much all of the issues, especially the ergonomic sort of operator comfort and safety things associated with current rototillers, but we can't, we haven't been able to figure out a way to afford to make it that we can sell it. We hoped to license the technology. We did get a utility patent, um, which came through about a year ago, finally. And we wanted to go to big manufacturers of rototillers. Well, I don't know if any of you happen to know this, but there's like maybe three or four companies, period, because there's been such a consolidation. Like there's one company, it's either MTD or MDT, I figure, forget which. They've bought up like so many other companies. So you have a tiny, tiny, tiny pool of companies that might be interested. Um, Honda's another one. There's one called DR Power, which used to be this little company in Vermont, but they were actually bought by uh, the Generac people who make, oh, I think it's Generac, who make home generators. So they still operate pretty much autonomously, I guess. But anyway, so we make our pitch. Here's this great technology solves all these problems, you know, we asked people what they wanted, this is what they wanted, and, um, you know, do you want to make it? And what we've learned, first of all, the, the short answer is nobody was into it, <laughs> but we realized that when companies are already making good money selling something that they already have all the tooling to make, et cetera, why, why do they want to do something different, especially something that's actually a new technology which people would need to learn how to use? So that's how you can get, you can be in a position where you have designed something that you feel so good about. It has such potential, but you're a tiny company and there are so many barriers between you and bringing that out to the customer that, you know, we still haven't solved that. Now I want to end on a positive note, which is that we um, do expect in this coming year to bring our farm cart, which we had the sample of down at the greenhouse, our three-wheeled wheelbarrow and our post-pounder and post-pounder accessory, which will have a better name. We do expect to bring those out this year. So, you know, we, we already have two pieces of equipment on the market, our shovel, and we have a spading fork based on the same research. We expect to bring those pieces of equipment out. So in that sense, you know, we've been around 10 years and we are bringing stuff to market. But the challenges that we've faced you know, some of which, again, we haven't figured out how to solve, have been really formidable. And that's, that's our story in a nutshell. Thank you. Yeah.